Hello, welcome to ThinkTech Asia. Uh, coming to you from downtown Honolulu, I'm your host Hong Jiang. I'm an associate professor of geography, also a China scholar uh, from UH Manoa. And uh, today's topic is China's influence, uh, our China's influence operations in the U.S. So our guest today is uh, uh, Mr. Kerry Gershanek. And Kerry is not a um, stranger to those of you who are familiar with Think Tech shows. And he has been a frequent guest and a leading um, expert on security issues in Asia Pacific area. And he has a great amount of experience with uh, China, Asia Pacific, and uh, US um, uh, Asia relations. I'll have Kerry introduce um, his work a little bit to our audience. So, Kerry, welcome. Thank Hong, you so much. Thank you for so much for us. having me back. Um, Got a little bit of background in, in the topic that we're going to discuss today, political warfare and, and how the People's Republic of China is conducting it through influence operations in the United States. I'm currently a, uh, an associate at uh, the East-West Center. I'm a fellow at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and I'm also a senior associate with uh, the, the world's leading foreign policy and security related think tank, Pacific Forum. Center for Strategic and International Studies, but that's more of the current academic side. Um, what's of value in our analysis today and our discussion we'll have on the, uh, the political warfare operations is that for a very lengthy military career, I worked in intelligence and counterintelligence throughout that, uh, alternating with combat arms and public affairs, public relations, and international relations responsibilities. So I was able to develop a very broad background from which to view, to analyze, and to make recommendations and policies regarding um, other countries' political warfare efforts against the United States. Uh, and I really, we appreciate having you here, um, using your expert knowledge and experience to shed lights on uh, this uh, you know, political warfare the Chinese government is waging in the U.S. That's something that is kind of hidden. So let's uh, get to some of the background of uh, U.S.-China relation. And there seems to be kind of on the surface, things are going on uh, on the uh, diplomatic relationship uh, side. A lot of people are aware of, you can read the news about. And then there's this hidden level of operation. That's something we're going to focus on today. But let's get to this background of U.S.-China relation. You know, uh, just a uh, uh, last March, uh, late March, uh, recently, uh, Chinese President uh, Xi and Obama met um, in the Nether Netherlands and seems to have a, a friendly meeting and they promised to have a, a cooperation. Um, right. so at the same time, there seems to be other things going on, frictions and tensions. Um, so maybe you can kind of give us some examples, uh, starting from last, um, this is related to the military front side, uh, that. Um, I think it was, uh, was it last year that in uh, South China Sea, uh, the encounter of uh, the Chinese carrier with the USS uh, Kao Pans. Okay. Well, we'll take, uh, take all the issues that you've addressed. Yes, the, uh, the political warfare aspects, the influence operations aspect are by definition almost uh, hard to detect. They are covert by and large. They're, they're black operations, uh, special measures is the terminology used. Uh, there are some overt political warfare or influence operations that go on, and we'll, we'll try to cover the whole range during our discussion today. The, the broader geopolitical uh, context is exactly what you said. It starts uh, most recently with the G-Obama meeting in the Netherlands last March, and on the surface, um, it's a nice follow-up to the Sunnylands meeting where they again vow at the highest levels more cooperation, more uh, transparency, more you know, openness in, in the, uh, the way that this new power relationship between the United States and, uh, and the People's Republic of China. Beneath that, it's not all that smooth. Mm -hmm. um, beneath that, um, you have the December 5th incident with the USS Calpens, uh, which is with the uh, USS George Washington Carrier Battle Group that's, uh, that's operating in the same general area as the, the new uh, PRC, people, our Chinese carrier, the, uh, Liaoning, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, the Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy is what mm -hmm. it's called, the PLA Navy, um, sends a amphib, very cheap vessel, unless it's full of troops, but it's an amphibious uh, transport that's simply designed to carry soldiers or Marines. Um, 
and sets it up so it could have, it potentially had a devastating um, collision mm -hmm. with a very high-priced, high-tech um, guided missile cruiser, the USS Calpens, mm -hmm. uh, trying to keep, the, ostensibly, or what they claim is they were trying to keep it away from the, their, their aircraft carrier. Uh, the transport stops about 100 meters directly wow. in front of a, a fast-moving Calpens. Calpens has to take evasive actions. Absolute insanity on the high seas, just absolute, um, not even lack of professionalism, which is what the, the Defense Department called the, uh, the, the Russian aircraft uh, buzzing our, our ship in, in the Black Sea uh, uh, over the weekend. But worse than that, it was an intentional effort to create an incident. Um, what was the explanation from the Chinese government side? Ch Chinese the was, there was, uh, there was plenty of time for the U.S. to react. The U.S. shouldn't have been there. It's the U.S.'s fault for being there. It's the okay. blame America first mentality okay. that we see both in the U.S. sometimes, but certainly okay. from the PLA daily and the, the People's Daily. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all our fault okay. uh, that okay. they planted their amphibious uh, vessel at a dead halt uh, directly in the uh, fast mm -hmm. uh, path of the fast-moving cow pens. Again, nonsense, but had the potential to blow up to be a tremendously um, uh, difficult situation, but very difficult incident had the cow pens collided. Mm. Um, fast forward now to, uh, there's a number of other meetings and a number of other visits, um, but most recently, uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel um, in uh, visiting his counterpart, General Chang, in, uh, on April 8th, and it's, uh, on the surface, described by the public affairs types, the public relations type, as, oh, it was a good meeting, we had constructive talks. But you can tell at the press mm -hmm. conference they have on the 8th and then the follow-up discussions that uh, Hegel has with the students at China's National Defense University, there's a lot of friction, a lot of tension mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, they're trading barbs, uh, General Chang and, and uh, Hegel are trading barbs at a press conference, basically, most of the barbs coming from General Chang and, and uh, Hegel, if you read the transcripts, being a bit more defensive, just saying, mm -hmm. no, we're not trying to contain China, where uh, Chang there and other places is lambasting the U.S. for standing up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oddly mm -hmm. enough, standing mm -hmm. up for its treaty allies, Japan and the Philippines, and mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. the conflicts that, uh, that, that China is bringing to the shores of uh, uh, the Philippines and to uh, uh, in the East China Sea uh, with Japan, South China Sea with the Philippines. So you have, um, you have that combined with the, the, the Chinese establishment of a, a air defense identification zone in the That's East China right, Sea yeah, yeah, yeah. and talk by uh, senior officials in China that we're going to likely do that mm. in the South China Sea. And there is a now a, uh, in the South China Sea the establishment of sort of like a, a fishing defense zone mm -hmm. where all fishing boats now have to register with Hainan mm -hmm. to get permission to, to fish in most of the South China Sea. So basically unilateral coercive efforts on China's part to uh, acquire territory from the Philippines, acquire territory mm -hmm. from uh, that, that Japan is responsible for administering, uh, that is not helping Sino-US relations much because again we're supporting our allies. Um, when you said Hegel was defensive, uh, defending the U.S. interests there uh, mm -hmm. and the interests of the Allies, uh, was China advancing, you know, uh, criticizing the U.S. At, at these meetings? Pretty openly, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but what's encouraging? I mean, I, th I think Secretary Hegel was his first you know, visit over there mm -hmm. and uh, his counterpart. And so Secretary Hegel, I think, was being diplomatic, was being circumspect in, in his responses. What's encouraging lately, the trend that I see, is that there is a, more of a willingness now by, uh, by senior U.S. officials uh, to, to be a little more blunt about China. All the while, for years, uh, since five years since uh, Obama's been president, uh, the, the Chinese have had no reservations at all about consistently attacking the United States or our friends and allies in their publications, through their, their diplomatic, their, their news media organizations, PLA Daily, if you would expect that from, but the People's Daily, China Daily, all the, the international CCTV, it's, it's relentless because that's party doctrine. The attacks are party doctrine. The U.S. has been uh, what's been described as dovish. Mm -hmm. We, the mm -hmm. U.S. officials have been yeah. very, very careful, and, and if you spoke out, if you were a military officer and you spoke out about the Chinese threat, you're career faced a uh, very abrupt end um, if you were too open in it. Now I see people like uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, 
uh, William Burns uh, speaking quite openly about mm -hmm. those issues that we have um, with the PRC, with the People's Republic of China, regarding, uh, again, their coercion, their intimidation, their, their threats to the freedom of navigation in the East China Sea, South mm -hmm. China Sea. Mm -hmm. So I'm encouraged by that, that there's more of a willingness by U.S. officials to recognize what, what many, many at the lower levels have been very anxious about in the U.S. military establishment. Uh, of course, what you're talking about here, a lot of these uh, are relating to the national security of the U.S., especially when we talk about uh, defense security uh, coming from the military uh, kind of uh, defense background. Uh, I also wonder, in terms of the dy dynamic you describe, it's not just the military, but it's, uh, it's related to um, uh, seem to be um, showing in both the government, the Chinese government, having a very harsh line against the U.S. Uh, publicly, openly, because it's all, all in their tones, in their publications. And the U.S. seems to be kind of very soft, you know, um, very uh, congenial, uh, not really taking a harsh line uh, to respond to the Chinese government's uh, kind of a, a very harsh tone. You, you said this is kind of starting to change a little bit? I, I see more in what is being said publicly by our officials mm -hmm. uh, and, or what uh, they have allowed to be said. For example, Admiral Harris, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, allowed his intelligence officer, the N2 is what it's called there, uh, a, a great gentleman named uh, Captain James Fennell, to, to go on record publicly in a widely publicized speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, about uh, the PRC planning a, quote, short, sharp war against mm -hmm, Japan. Mm -hmm. That got people's attention mm -hmm. because no one was allowed to say, you know, to make um, comments like that, to, to make analysis like that and say it publicly. And I think that's a gross disservice to the American people and to the American government when you have such rigid control of the message simply uh, to, uh, to fulfill what to me are not necessarily healthy foreign policy objectives or political objectives where you stifle that open discussion of what is the real nature mm -hmm. of the, the country we're dealing with. And, and in the case of the People's Republic of China, that's critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one thing if you have even Taiwan building a strong navy. Mm -hmm. If you have um, it's one thing if you have, say, uh, the Kingdom of Thailand, the government of the Kingdom of Thailand right now has a very strong lobbying effort and it, it's very effective uh, getting positive coverage from, say, the New York Times or Time Magazine or the Washington Post. It's, it's very one-sided in, in the political crisis that's going on, the coverage that you see. But Thailand doesn't pose a, a major threat to the United States. Thailand isn't threatening our armed forces, our status, our allies in the Asia-Pacific region. Thailand is a treaty ally of mm -hmm. ours. If Oslo, in Norway, starts to build a big fleet and, and says that we're going to protect our fisheries, we're not going to be too worried about that. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's, it's not a country that is basically out to confront the U.S. military and it is not a country that's trying to kick the U.S. out of Asia and to, to gain a certain hegemony over the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. region. These are all stated goals. If you, if you read the Chinese, uh, and you can, mm -hmm. many Americans can't, yeah, read right. the Chinese doctrinal publications, military doctrinal publications in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're printed in English now. A lot, a lot is printed in English, um, but I, I in am Chinese. aware. I am yeah. aware of a lot of those very harsh uh, rhetorics right. from the yes. Chinese side. So uh, apparently, you know, this kind of a, uh, open uh, uh, diplomatic uh, military confrontation tensions are building up and uh, we're going to then move to the undercurrent of this relationship there to look at a political warfare and influence operation. We're going to take a short break here uh, and when we come back we'll get to the undercurrent of what's happening there. So this is Hong Jiang at Asia, um, Think Tech Asia, oh, used to be called Asia in Review and uh, we'll be right back after this short break. I'm Jake Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. 
And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. I'm Jay. Hi, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, and uh, uh, I have uh, uh, our guest today is uh, our uh, resident expert, Kerry Gershenek. And we've been talking about China's influence operations in the U.S. So we started by addressing these kind of uh, open diplomatic military relationships between China and the U.S., and apparently it's not all that peaceful. At the same time, there are these undercurrent things are covert that's happening. Um, uh, uh, not everybody is aware of, and you call it uh, political warfare. Can you explain that? That sounds like a very violent kind of thing. Well, you, you, you're right. I call it political warfare, but it's not my term. It's the People's Republic of China's term. That's it's, uh, it's a form of warfare that, that uh, owes a lot to the the uh, organization, the doctrine of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and to Nazi Germany. Uh, and I'll, I can go into that a little bit more later on. But basically, political warfare is a combination of diplomacy, what we call diplomacy, traditional diplomacy, then public diplomacy, mm -hmm. where they're going around to the people of different countries to try to achieve foreign policy objectives rather than going directly to their governments. Mm -hmm. uh, psychological warfare, propaganda, subversion, deception. It's a combination of a lot of functions that, that we in the United States or say Japan or other countries, we generally split these functions up into separate categories. We, we stovepipe them off all too often. Um, but in the Communist Party's history, mm -hmm. both in the Soviet Union and in the, the People's Republic of China, going back to Chairman Mao back during the Civil War, mm -hmm. political warfare was a major, major component of the overall battles they were fighting, whether it was against the nationalists in China, mm -hmm. whether it was against the Japanese occupation from the 1930s to 1945, um, or whether it was against the Americans and UN forces in the Korean War from 1950 to 53, and then mm -hmm. the Cold War uh, that we think, that most Americans think, ended in 1991. Mm. Um, political warfare is a huge component uh, in the, the People's Republic of China's arsenal. You said this is a warfare that's directed to the people, not the government. Can you explain that? It, well, it's actually both. It's actually mm -hmm. both, but it's, it's combining a number of capabilities, and mm -hmm. it's considered warfare. All countries, Hong, mm -hmm. all, all countries, want to influence other countries that's and their right, perceptions yeah, yeah. of the country. That's normal, that's right, healthy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the People's Republic of China, or most communist countries, take this to a, a really extraordinary level, though, because, again, they're combining all these capabilities that if you can't win something through traditional diplomacy mm -hmm. or bribery or coercion or blackmail, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you bring together all these components and uh, then you achieve victory that way. In fact, ideally with political warfare, you achieve victory with ne by never firing a shot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so sort of the Sun Tzu approach, but uh, mm -hmm. now using communist doctrine, political warfare doctrine. So the, the mentality there is very much like a Cold War Mao, Mao is the kind of mentality, it seems like. Oh, oh it is, and, and, and that's that. why, again, it's, it's of great concern uh, mm -hmm. uh, what it is that the PRC is doing, because what I, what I perceive under President Xi is a return to, to more, the more authoritarian Maoist uh, approach within the, the PRC, the strengthening of the military, the, the strengthening of thought control. Um, so yes, it's very much Maoist, but again, it goes back to the 1920s mm -hmm. when Mao and the, the 
people who formed the Communist Party of China were advised they had uh, Soviet Union advisors within the Chinese Communist Party. And so that doctrine derives largely from the Soviet Union's political warfare doctrine. And again, the Nazi uh, Party in Germany, um, in terms of organization, funding, provision of, of large staffs, large resources to the mm-hmm. political warfare and influence operations capabilities, direct playbook from the Nazi Party of uh, you know, Nazi Germany. Um, this is something serious because uh, we see China is changing, we see the world is changing, and you're telling us uh, the kind of rhetoric, the kind of mindset, the kind of method the Chinese government is using to wage these uh, political warfare or influence operations uh, outside of China, or in this case in the U.S., are still very much a kind of traditional, almost like traditional communist kind of approach. Which This is something I don't think a lot of people are aware of, uh, no, especially the, in the U.S. In, in the U.S., we don't... We, most Americans don't understand this because, again, it's designed to be covert. You're yeah, not yeah, going yeah. to advertise that you've uh, you've managed to get s- these reporters or this news organization in your pocket. Like, like mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I can name names later on in terms of organizations. Uh, you you aren't going to advertise that we got Hollywood mm-hmm. to change the script of this movie mm-hmm. to take out any reference to the People's Republic of China as being an evil force or being an enemy. Um, and that we, we, we blackmailed basically the production organizations in Hollywood that you will never distribute another movie in what is now the second largest uh, movie audience in the world. Uh, People's Republic of China mm-hmm. just surpassed Japan mm-hmm. in the past months as the second largest. Uh, you'll never get another movie distributed, mm-hmm. period, unless you portray China the way we want you to portray it. In effect, there are censors in Hollywood, but you don't read much about that. Mm. No one's advertising that because it's largely covert. And you have, frankly, Secretary of State Kerry, who was shocked that the the Russians invaded Crimea because that isn't how modern uh, countries, G8 nations, react. And I'm quoting mm-hmm. just you know that's basically true. what he said. Well, that's because the elites in our country, the ones in charge, live in a sort of fantasy world, an <laughs> ivy tower. Uh-huh. And they think everyone's just like them, attending all the right cocktail parties and spouting all the, mm-hmm. the, the right bromides and all the right platitudes. Mm-hmm. There's thugs in the world. That's there's right. evil nations in the world. There is evil in the world. And there's totalitarian regimes or totalitarian at heart regimes. Mm-hmm. And I think slowly the current re, uh, regime in Washington is waking up to that. Uh, they got slapped rudely in the face, just as Jimmy Carter did with Russia's the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, and he woke up that you know there was something wrong with communism, there is something bad about it. I think Crimea has helped the power structure in Washington to wake up that there are some really pretty brutal regimes out there that have ill intentions. Um, you just gave an example uh, of uh, these uh, influence operations in the U.S. in terms of Hollywood. Can you yes. give some more examples? of how the Chinese influence is operating in the U.S.? Yeah, there's, um, there's hundreds of examples. Mm-hmm. There's, there's everything from the general, the, the, the think tank academic who self-censors or else that academic will never get a, um, uh, another visa to okay. China. Yeah, yeah. It's the expulsion of, of American and other journalists uh, the, from the People's Republic of China if they write articles that the, the China doesn't like. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the blocking of the New York Times and Bloomberg websites in China mm-hmm. um, where, again, they, they, they frame the news, they frame perceptions in the way they want it there, they frame the reporting that comes out of it. Their propaganda department um, has in the United States a billion dollar organization called uh, CCTV with more, with hundreds and, and or at least a hundred and probably more now, uh, probably closer to 150 uh, reporters all over the United States. There's a handful of Western reporters in Beijing, mm. not not a whole lot, but in the United States, the place is saturated with uh, Xinhua, CCTV, uh, China Daily, all all these reporters who are here. Um, so these are all ways that China influences in the reporting that's done by non-Chinese reporters, in the reporting 
that is seen in America by their reporters. So look like an objective uh, reporting fitting with the international standards. Fitting journalism. with international standards, but what most Americans don't understand mm -hmm. is that the propaganda department of the Chinese, uh, the Communist Party of China, um, owns all news organizations mm -hmm. in China. Now, yeah. Not everyone is controlled down to every word they write, but they know that if they uh, if they write the wrong things, they're out. Of, those reporters are out of a job. Their families will mm -hmm. suffer exponentially beyond what an American reporter loses a job mm. uh, faces. American reporter loses a job. American reporter can go flip burgers at McDonald's or go become a great, you know, write the great American novel. In China, mm. if you lose your job as a journalist because you violated Communist Party protocols and dictates as to what you're allowed to cover and what you're not, your whole family suffers. They don't get jobs. They lose their preferred apartments. They lose mm -hmm. their housing. Mm -hmm. They're punished. Your family is punished, not just you. Yeah. So you can be pretty sure that uh, all news organizations belong to the Communist Party under the propaganda department. And that even though there's some latitude in what they can cover, you don't stray real far mm -hmm. from the party line or else your family suffers tremendously. What's interesting is that we actually have CCTV right here in Hawaii. You know, you, yes. you, you uh, switch on the, your TV station. I actually saw one of the stations, a CCTV. I said, oh, wow. It's all in English. And uh, you can't quite tell. You can't quite tell. This is actually a organ that's uh, CCTV. is a Chinese central uh, TV station. It's right. basically the party-controlled TV right. station. You can't tell just because the way, the format of the operation is like, oh, just like any... Uh, TV media. Uh -huh. they, they studied CNN closely and, and they hire Western reporters. So you have the blonde, you mm -hmm. have, you know, the blonde girl reporting the news. Mm -hmm. You have the red haired from Minnesota, the blonde girl from New England or, or Oslo or Norway. Um, it looks mm. just like any other major international news organization, but the Americans, the people around the world don't see mm -hmm. the puppet masters from the Communist Party of China, the propaganda department, who are behind that news organization. So this kind of a, I guess you could call it a form of this de deception. It's making it very hard for the ordinary people to see what's going on, because for you, for you, like you are the expert, you know what's going on behind the scenes. And for the ordinary people, they just, you know, uh, see this TV station and, and uh, they don't see this operation that's going on behind the scenes. Which is, uh, I guess, uh, maybe that a uh, reason why this topic is, is so important. Yeah, they they don't see what goes on behind the the, the scenes, or the Americans don't. Um, and because these news organizations, again, they've studied CNN, they've studied the other successful um, broadcast news. Of course, they're going to present regular news. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when you it's very clever propaganda the way they get in there. They, they'll insert the party line or they'll, they'll uh, mm -hmm. spike, that is, they'll, um, uh, they'll either distort or they'll actually just ignore stories that are not beneficial to China. Um, so you're watching this. Some Americans understand they're watching a propaganda show. Others don't. They're watching what they see. Oh, they reported that we're having a blizzard in the Midwest. Wow, that's that seems pretty it's good. good reporting. <laughs> they're reporting that there's you know there's an economic progress here, and and now they're reporting that the smog in Beijing is really good for the people of, of China, because. Um, and because it, it blocks American radars for their missiles coming into attack, for wow. example. Wow, that's uh, new there's perspective. Other, right, but that, this is exactly <laughs> the stuff that comes out of Beijing. I oh mean, there's. You, you have to, you know, it, it's, you can't make this stuff up, some of it. But a lot of it's much more clever than that. Uh -huh. A lot of it is propaganda interspersed with uh, regular news reporting. Uh -huh. And so most people don't pick it up. They don't even realize they're being propagandized. That, yeah, that's really interesting. So the, the uh, uh, political warfare is operating in a more and more sophisticated manner. Yes. And uh, making the influence probably more and more effective in a way that's, that's intended. So uh, let's take another break. Uh, we will come back and talk more about this. This okay. is uh, Think Tech Asia, and we'll be talking about China's influence operations in the U.S. We will be right back. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week, I'm right here at Think Tech Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Boards' as Bio Briefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim. We see if they catch anybody. We check out the latest biosimilars. You know, 
The kind that, uh, what was his name? The guy with the bicycle? Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here, Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii, Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. Hello, we're back. This is Think Tech Asia. We're live coming to you from downtown Honolulu. So we've been speaking with uh, uh, our um, leading expert in Honolulu, Kerry Gersenek, about China's influence operations in the U.S. Uh, a lot of these operations, uh, you and I probably uh, are not that uh, aware of. Uh, for those uh, who are the experts in the field, they are um, a lot more aware and have a lot more knowledge. So uh, Kerry, so we're just talking about this uh, um, influence operation, political warfare the Chinese government is conducting is having becoming more sophisticated. And one of the things uh, during the break you talk about is uh, Chinese journalists coming to study in the U.S. Chinese journalists come here to study uh, at the University of Hawaii. The uh, Chinese communication majors come here. They come to major universities in the United States. They come to study at UH at uh, Hawaii Pacific University. And they learn a lot um, about the, the theory and the practice of communication. And so that's helped on the, uh, the Chinese development of, say, their news media organizations, their public relations. But again, you have to understand the political warfare in, in China goes back to the 20s with Mao and the, the Communist Revolution. Even the nationalists have their, they, they still have on Taiwan political warfare officers and their military. So political warfare, the combination of public relations, propaganda, mm -hmm. subversion, deception, um, the psychological, the whole psychological dimension that, that uh, tries to form the opinions of the American public. The, American military leaders, the diplomats, the president, everybody from the president all the way down to average Joe and Jane American, all these efforts are very, very sophisticated. There was always a strong program to begin with, but they've come and studied with the best. And mm -hmm. I taught at Hawaii Pacific University Department of Communication for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I saw people from many countries coming in to study, but certainly the People's Republic of China was there uh, in what was then a very strong communication program and taking back all these skills. Some went to work, many went to work for private firms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some went to work, go to work for the government. Mm. So they get, they're building a particularly effective uh, propaganda effort, much more effective than the Soviet Union ever had. So partly you, <laughs> teaching the Chinese journalists, all of, you know, U.S. universities are helping to train the uh, Chinese uh, journalists to, be, to become more sophisticated. S some journalists and, again, communication majors. And I'm, yeah. I'm not, I don't want to paint them all. I don't want to tar them all, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly some of them do go back to work for their, their governments, mm -hmm. uh, their um, government, the People's Republic of China, which is the Communist Party of China. Mm -hmm. Most Americans don't understand that. And because they don't understand that, that's why not, maybe the rest of this may not make sense to some folks. When you're a soldier in the People's Republic of China, unlike America, you don't pledge allegiance to the country. Mm -hmm. You don't pledge allegiance to China. You pledge allegiance to the Communist Party of and, China. And that, that is a very important point. Yes. So you have to understand everything derived from that. That's why it is most disconcerting what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Other countries could be doing this to an extent, wouldn't mm -hmm. be worried. Yeah. It is because of the nature of the totalitarian nature mm -hmm. of the People's Republic of China, the belligerence that it's displaying, the in geometrically enhanced military capabilities, mm -hmm. economic capabilities, and influence ops political warfare capabilities mm -hmm. it has now. That's what makes China different. You know, for people who are listening to the show, they, uh, especially if they have certain views about China, U.S.-China relations, mm -hmm. they might say, well, you know, you're just anti-China. And from what you are saying here, what you are criticizing is really the operation that's centered around the Chinese Communist government, not the Chinese people. So they're different right. Chinas. It's not about uh, the enemy of the Chinese people. You are the friend of Chinese people and trying to help them uh, to uh, you know, reveal some of these operations that's operated by the, the party, the government. 
Right. And it's, it's incidentally the 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 common attack. You're right. Well, the, because you can't uh, the the critics of what we're talking about can't defeat us on facts, and they can't defeat us on the ideas front. So they'll always resort to the racist attack. Mm -hmm. uh, you're Chinese. You're from China. You can't be considered anti-Chinese. Oh, I be all, always be. one in the in the in the room when I when I have people who who say this the the pro Beijing types uh, or pro communist party types, I'll ask them how many of you have put your life on the line to defend Chinese people, mm -hmm. and and they can't raise their hands, but I can because I have put my life on the line as a U.S. Marine to defend mm -hmm. Chinese people, and I've yeah. been very heavily engaged in Chinese history, culture, and other activities for many many years uh, here in the United States and, and extolling it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a digression, but that is a common attack for anyone who tries to expose what we mm -hmm. are talking about. And that's very important because that's part of political warfare. What you just gave was one of the perfect examples of how the PRC silences critics. Ah, to say you you're just anti-Chinese. You're anti-Chinese. Ooh, that's like being called racist. That immediately shuts you that's up. That's interesting. Um, and many people do shut up as a result of that. Or mm -hmm. it's more overt that... Um, we will make sure you never get a visa again, mm -hmm. or you'll never be invited, you Mr. Academic or Miss mm -hmm. uh, Academic, mm -hmm. um, or uh, you'll, you're Miss Reporter. You'll never mm -hmm. be invited to any of these high-level conferences, mm -hmm. or you're not invited mm -hmm. to the right cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. um, so there's many ways that are sort of low-level coercion. And then there's the higher level ones where you're actually blackmailed, which is, happens to many people from Taiwan, generals, mm -hmm. others in America as well. Um, or you, you could be persuaded with money as well, and I'll talk about the Sanya Initiative where a number of uh, U.S. retired generals and admirals uh, were brought in to basically lobby for the PRC, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so, um, so a lot of these um, operations that you see happening, especially it's using blackmail, uh, it kind of doesn't come out to the public. That's also making it very difficult for the public to know. And people mm -hmm. might say, oh, you're, you're just being alar uh, alarmist. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can address some of uh, how the Chinese uh, government's influence is uh, operating in Hawaii, you know, right mm -hmm. in the community. Uh, that well, way people can have a better understanding. I think between the two of us, we have a lot of experience with these groups. And, and one that I'll, I'll start by talking about the uh, uh, the Chinese Association of International Friendly Con Con Contacts, excuse me, China mm -hmm. Association of International Friendly Contacts. Mm -hmm. The acronym is CAFIC. Mm -hmm. um, CAFIC is basically a People's Liberation Army funded organization. It is designed, if you, you know, it's not hard to find this out, incidentally, it's, it's, it's all on the web. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, with the CAFIC program, part of CAFIC, uh, is to get retired general and uh, flag officers, admirals and generals from the U.S. military and bring them over to China and then influence them basically to see Beijing's view of, say, the South China Sea dispute with, uh, with the Philippines and with all the, all the other countries of ASEAN basically mm -hmm. uh, regarding islets and, and uh, shoals down in the South China Sea or the Senkaku, Dayu, um, uh, dispute uh, in the East China Sea or, or other disputes. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to an extent, uh, the, uh, they've been successful mm -hmm. to some degree because you have people like uh, a, a retired vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Bill, uh, uh, Bill Owens, and you had a retired chief of staff of the Air Force, a guy named Fogelman, Mm -hmm. uh, and others who basically came back from one offshoot of that, which was called the Sanya Initiative, basically going to the Pentagon mm. to lobby, uh, citing basically the Beijing party line. Oh, interesting. And um, associated with these deals often are lucrative business deals on the side and mm -hmm. that. And I, uh, all I know is, is what I read in the papers about mm -hmm. this, and very few papers actually covered this, but oh, wow. and some reports did. So... There, there's places you can find this out, incidentally, and at, at the end of the program, let's talk about Project 2049 mm -hmm. Institute and, and mm -hmm. uh, the Jamestown Foundation and the Heritage Foundation, where people can go online and learn a bit more mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, let's give that information uh, to our audience at the very end. Yes. Let's take a uh, good time to take our last short break. This is uh, Think Tech Asia, and uh, I'm your host, Hong Jiang. We'll be talking about uh, China's 
influence operations in the U.S. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Hi, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Asia, and we've been speaking with uh, uh, Kerry Kashanek about China's influence operations in the U.S. Um, so we were just talking about uh, some of these experiences in Hawaii. This is actually everywhere. We don't have all that time to, to ex explain all that. But can you name some of, the, some of the key organizations that actually are some of these uh, front organizations? I'll, I'll talk about front organizations and uh, talked about uh, one, the uh, China Association, uh, Chinese Association of uh, International Friendly Contacts, KFIC. Um, but in, in addition to front organizations, there's targeted organizations, organizations targeted for infiltration and manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the People's Liberation Army specifically targets the International Red Cross, <laughs> believe it or not, and its, uh, its political warfare guidelines. And uh, again, the Project 2049 uh, uh, Institute puts out a, put out a wonderful report on, on this, on a political I warfare see. report. Mm -hmm. um, the KFIC that we've talked about operates here, but it operates around the world as well, other American cities. And again, the idea largely is to get retired military personnel uh, to see, to be persuaded or, or maybe given incentives, economic incentives to to convey the Beijing party line, and that's well documented in congressional testimony and, mm -hmm. and congressional findings. Um, there's other organizations that are commercial. And yeah. just to give one example, I, I, I spent several weeks studying uh, mainland Chinese political warfare in, in, in Taiwan. I went to the Republic of China to, mm -hmm. to meet with experts there this, this past summer for several weeks. And um, learned about organizations such as Poly Technologies and CARI, not my first name, but C-A-R-R-I-E, Enterprises. Uh, basically, these are you know, more than 20 subsidiaries of these organizations for conducting political warfare operations against uh, Taiwan, Republic of China. Mm -hmm. So there, it's, you have to look across the whole spectrum. It's not nonprofits. It's not just international organizations that are affected. A lot of commercial organizations are used for political warfare purposes. American commercial organizations. Uh, there's, there's reports of major or, uh, commercial enterprises that have been told you will never get another contract in China or you mm -hmm. will never get a contract, period, unless you fund this think tank that is pro-Beijing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, organizations that um, uh, have impacted uh, American businesses, there's a, the Chinese answer to the Davos um, World Economic Forum is, a, is an outfit or is a uh, program called the Sanya International Finance Forum. Mm -hmm. And, and American and other non-Chinese, you know, other foreign countries other than China that come to there, they're given great incentives, mm -hmm. either as individuals or corporations, companies, mm -hmm. to tout the party line. Uh, and, and if they do, then they'll get, you know, they'll, they'll get special deals, special treatment. Um, I want to add something uh, that I usually don't do as a host, but I want to join you in the discussion because yes. uh, as a Chinese, coming to Hawaii, I've been here for eight years, I actually experienced plenty of those uh, um, effect of the Chinese government influ influence in the U.S. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, when, we, when we call these uh, front organizations, they are really, um, people don't know they actually have such a close connection with the Chinese communist government. Right. And some of the organizations here in Hawaii are just, you know, Chinese 
um, non for profit and associations and the clubs, uh, friendship organizations, and even like uh, you know uh, organizations related to, to, to the con to the commons, as you say, and they appear to be uh, building culture, building connection with China. It's all great stuff, but you really experience some of these, uh, um, you know how these organizations told the, the line of the Communist Party, especially in things uh, uh, related to um, the, the stuff that Chinese government didn't want people to know. And I want to just give you a quick example because we just have a few minutes left. So I volunteer for a Chinese TV station that's independent Chinese TV station based in the U.S. called New Tang Dynasty Television. Yes. And it's actually in Hawaii, it's on Oceanic 68. Hawaiian Telecom 28, um, it's a global TV station, reports the news on China, uncensored. And of course, Chinese government doesn't like it. And uh, there are certain organizations in Hawaii that would censor this, that uh, in uh, some of the cultural affairs like uh, Splendor of China, it's a cultural event, and uh, this uh, TV station cannot get a booth. Okay, so because you aren't towing the Beijing party line, you're not owned by the propaganda department of the Communist Party of China. NDTV right. is not allowed to come cover the event it, to it, participate. It's not allowed to be to have a booth. To have a booth at this, these cultural events. At, at what is uh, billed? By, who 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 runs the splendor of China? Who's behind uh, so, that? So this particular example is the is a Chinese Chamber of Commerce, okay. and of course there's no explanation. Just say, oh, you're late in your application. So again, it's, it's, it's not something you have a document to say, well, we don't like you because uh, uh, the Chinese government doesn't ah, like you. So it's very kind of uh, interesting in a very similar way that you see how things are operating. So you're, you're frozen out, but quietly, covertly frozen out. That, that's right. Yeah, what, yeah. what are the other organizations here in Hawaii uh, with which uh, you've come uh, So I teach at UH, and yes. we have a Confucius Institute, and yes. uh, uh, most people don't know the institute is actually funded by the Chinese government. The Chinese government has particular regulations about how to teach culture and language, how what things not to cover, especially things related to like, human rights in China, right. and who to hire even. But these are the kind of things that you don't quite see, and Confucius Institute is quietly and friendly um, um, kind of uh, integrated into the UH, just as a organization because they, they do host these public lectures and uh, uh, East West Center has worked jointly with the Confucius Institute so it's it's just making it more blended um, into the public scene into the local community yeah, the Confucius uh, Institute is, is everywhere there's there's how many of those 327 in the world yes. and if you look at reports on Confucius Institute it's a very much of uh, uh, in line with what you're talking about the influence operation it's, it's, it's soft one. it's soft power that's how people would perceive it that's how it's conveyed and the soft power is not a bad thing American mm -hmm. Joseph Nye uh, yeah. from Harvard uh, uh, coined the phrase it's not a, it's a good thing but mm -hmm. if it's part of a covert um, psychological operations or political warfare, that, that changes the nature. If, if this is reporting to the Communist Party of China, which is what you're saying, that's, the government is right, the Communist yeah. Party, yeah. that makes the nature of it uh, perhaps not as pure as, as many people who observe it might think it is. I, I think it should really add to what you said about the sophistication of these operations. Yeah. And uh, before we uh, finish the program, I want you to name those sources people can go to to get more information about this. One of the, uh, you, you can Google this online, but the 20, uh, Project 2049 Institute has done some great work on, uh, on political warfare, Chinese political warfare, Mark Stokes, Ru Russell Xiao, um, have uh, authored a particularly good publication. Uh, Jamestown Foundation, again, Google it online. Heritage Foundation, Google it online. U.S., uh, one of the more important ones as well is the U.S.-China Economic and Security Commission. Again, Google their products because there's some of the very few that actually cover this. The news media, by and large, does not. Occasionally, when the New York Times gets offended that their reporters aren't allowed to report on corruption or other issues in China, they'll report something. Bloomberg basically recently caved to the Chinese saying we shouldn't have exposed all this mm -hmm. corruption mm -hmm. because it's more important that we be in China mm -hmm. than that we actually report news. That's basically what their, mm -hmm. their, their, seat, their head person said. Um, there's those, those organizations 
that our listeners can go to, and education is probably the most important step that we as Americans can take right now, mm -hmm. become aware of this threat, this war that's being conducted against us, this political war. So the, this is definitely a very important question, and, and uh, we can keep talking about it. Maybe we should have you back to We talk could next do time. five more shows yeah. on this and talk about what it is America needs to do to resurrect the same counter-political warfare capability we had against the Soviet At Union. At least we need to be educated. And thank you so much, Kerry, for being with us and educating us about China's influence operations in the U.S. Thank We're you, running Hong. out of time. And uh, this is a Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.